Good morning, Open Arms. We are happy that you're here today. Thank you for tuning in today to Truth. Uh, we're using this virtual platform to be able to uh, still be the church. So uh, there in front of you, there's a thumbs up. Would you give us a thumbs up? Let us know that you're and uh, arrived at virtual church. And also, would you comment and just greet one another. Uh, I know you have not seen each other in a long period of time, but greet one another, uh, say hi, and you can interact with today's message uh, in doing that as well. Also, will you share? That's the third favor I'll ask of you today. Would you share? Uh, this message has gotten across to hundreds of people that otherwise it would not have reached unless you share of the message in your timeline. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for doing that. We uh, have reached uh, just numerous of people who have commented on today's message uh, from times past. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for sharing truth and not sharing the virus. Amen. Just want to remind you that we're still doing our Zoom meetings on Wednesdays and on Fridays at 7 p.m. Wednesdays is our Bible studies. Fridays is our prayer time. This last Friday, we had just a rich time of prayer, even a time of worship and singing. So uh, we welcome you to join us for that. Also, uh, thank you for your faithful giving. Uh, God has been good. God has provided for our needs. So we are thankful that uh, you are continuing to be consistent and sacrificial in your support. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Because I am very excited about preaching this message. I've already preached it about three times to myself. And I think I've converted three times. So uh, I want to be able to share this uh, with our audience today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to speak to our hearts. Father, we are thankful for another opportunity to get your voice in this midst of a, a crisis, a storm. Thank you that you are not silenced, but thank you that your message from heaven still comes across to us on this earth. And there are things you want to say during this time. There are messages that you are giving us in preparation and in just getting our hearts ready for what you're doing in our lives. So God, we know that you uh, have us as your children in mind, that you have not forgotten us. But Lord, you are using this time to build in us a beautiful people. So Lord, would you speak to our hearts? Would you gather us as we gather around your presence? Would you gather our attention to your message today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We do ask that there where you are, would you set that up as a, an environment of worship? Uh, it's important for the next few moments that you're not distracted, but that you can just focus in on what the Lord wants to say. And I guarantee you, God wants to speak today. You know, today's sermon is entitled, How to Love God. How to Love God. And we just completed a three-point Easter series. Uh, the first uh, week we looked at the Garden of Eden, and we traveled from the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane. And from the Garden of Gethsemane, we travel to the Garden Tomb. And in that series, we learned that through uh, our separation, God made a, a possibility for us to be reconciled to him by the cross. And then in the resurrection, he gave us the power and also gave us a command on what to do in life. So we are, are still in the same in scenery, we're still in the same place of the resurrection. With today's message from John 21, God wants to speak to us about our love toward him. So let me give you a little background of John chapter 21. Uh, this is the period in which Jesus has resurrected and he has uh, he's hanging around for about 40 days with his disciples, with his friends. And we learned last week about his first appearance to his disciples after his resurrection. Remember, they were behind closed doors in fear. And Jesus walks through the door and appears before them. 
Well, he had appeared to them yet a second time within those 40 days. And now this is his third appearance. Third appearance. We find ourselves in John chapter 21 where Peter, the Bible teaches us, persuaded the other disciples to go back to fishing. I want you to note that. Jesus, early on in his ministry, called his disciples to follow him away from fishing. And he told them, gave them this decree, I want you to be fishermen of men and not fisher of fish. So he called them out of fishing. But now when we are in John 21, Jesus was crucified, Jesus resurrected, but now in John 21, Peter persuaded his, his disciples, his friends, Jesus' disciples, to go back to the fishing, to go back to what was familiar, to go back to what was comfortable. So now Jesus is in the shore and the fishermen that were there have fished all night long. Peter and, and John, and, and they fished all night long and caught nothing. That, that's a little a message for somebody already that whenever we go back to what's comfortable, whenever we go back to what's familiar, whenever we go back to the place where God called us out of, we are going to find ourselves unsuccessful. And that's what the, the disciples found themselves. They fished all night long and caught nothing. So Jesus from the shore yells out to the disciples, have you caught any fish? And I imagine that that question was unwelcomed by the disciples. Just imagine, you worked all night long, and you are tired, and you're exhausted, and you are unsuccessful. And then you hear someone from the beach calling out to you saying, have you caught any fish? Uh, my mindset would have been like, no, and don't rub it in. I know I have not done a good job. But then Jesus calls out from the shore and says, try your net on the other side of the boat. And the disciples are thinking to themselves, we are the professional fishermen. We know how to fish. We know that this side of the boat is the best side to catch fish. But because they were unsuccessful in disobedience, they decided to give obedience a chance. That speaks to some of us because we've been working so hard doing something and receiving the same result and not being successful at it. And sometimes God tells us, why don't you try doing it my way? So they did. They tried the net on the other side of the boat and the net became filled, filled. In fact, John noted it was 153 fish that filled the net. Peter recognized that it was the Lord, so he jumped out of the boat and swam to where Jesus was. The disciples followed along and met Jesus in the shore. What was Jesus doing? Jesus was cooking up some pancakes and some catfish, some bread actually, and some fish. He was making for them breakfast. Jesus cares about our dietary needs. I like that about Jesus. So Jesus is making breakfast for them when they arrive to the shore where Jesus was. And now Jesus has an opportunity. Listen, Jesus has an opportunity to restore Peter. One of Jesus' primary objectives in this encounter was to have a dialogue with Peter and to restore him. You see, just nights before this, it was that same Peter in a courtyard who watched Jesus be interrogated on trial, and three times Peter betrays Christ. Three times G uh, Peter denies Jesus. You remember that from a former sermon. And even now, in John 21, Peter is at a place of denial. Peter is at a place of betrayal. Because Jesus says, I want you to become fishermen of fish. And Peter, for different possibilities, he was probably 
sad that Jesus was not spending time with them after his resurrection. Or it's possible that Peter just felt defeated and discouraged. I just denied my Savior three times. There's no way possible that I can be called to be fishers of, of fishermen of fish, uh, of, of men. Instead, let me go back to being a fisherman of fish because I failed at the task in which God was calling me. For whatever purpose, whatever possibility that Peter was found back in his old life, Jesus used this opportunity to restore Peter. So here we are at the shore. Peter, all wet and also, just came from the shore, and the disciples arrived. And it begins to say in chapter 21, starting in verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, pause for a moment. It's interesting that Jesus did not call him Peter. He called him Simon. You see, Jesus previously had changed Simon's name to Peter because Peter represented his new life, his new calling, and that he would help to establish the new church. So he called him Peter, changes his name from Simon, but now in this encounter, he calls him Simon because he's not acting like a Simon. He's, act, he's not acting like a Peter. He's acting like a Simon because he's going back to his old life. And he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? So right before this, Jesus says, Peter, I want you to go get the fish from the boat. It wasn't that Jesus needed fish to cook breakfast. They just finished eating. And he had already provided for them the fish. But he had an object lesson to teach Peter. So Peter goes to the boat and drags 153 fish to where Jesus was. And then Jesus asked this question. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He was asking him. Do you love me more than these fish? Do you love me more than these nets? Do you love me more than these boats? Do you love me more than your former life? Do you love me more than your comfort zone? Do you love me more than that which you're familiar with? That's what Jesus was asking. Do you love me more than these? But interesting, Jesus did use the word Agapao, that's the Greek word he used, which is agapao is the highest level of expressive affection. It's the highest level of love. And what Jesus was telling Simon is, Simon, do you agapao me? Do you agape me the way we pronounce it in English? Do you agape me? Do you love me with the highest affection? Do you love me with the highest level of love? Do you love me? And Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But I want you to know that Peter does not use the word agapao in Greek, which is the highest level of love. Instead, he uses the word phileo, which is a brotherly love, which is a friendship love, which is not the highest level of love. And he says, Jesus, you know that I have this brotherly love toward you. Jesus is asking, do you love me with the highest level of love? And Peter says, ah, I don't know if I do. I have not demonstrated that. I have denied you three times. And now I'm back to fishing. I'm in disobedience to you. I don't know if I have shown you that I love you in that level. And Jesus responds by saying, feed my lambs. What, what does he mean by feed my lambs? I called you to be a fisherman of men and not a fisherman of fish. I want you to go back to what I called you to do, to love people, not love fish. See, one of the problems we have in life is that we love the things of this world. We love the fish. And God is never asking us, do we love fish? Do we love materialistic things? Do we love our car? Do we love our food? You know, during this quarantine time, uh, there's a lot of restaurants that I've loved. 
and I have had to give them up. You know, those things aren't secure in life. And Jesus is saying, I'm not asking you if you love fish. I'm asking you if you love that which is eternal and that which I've called you to. Do you love God? And do you love people? So he says, do you love uh, me? Do you, do you really love me in the greatest affection? And Peter says, ah, I love you as a brother. And then Jesus says, well, then do something for me. If you love me, do something. Show me by feeding my lambs. Then again, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you agapao me? Do you agape me? Do you love me with the highest affection? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. I love you with brotherly love. Jesus says, take care of my sheep. If you love me, love my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you listen? Now Jesus uses the word phileo in the third time. The first time Jesus says, do you love me with the highest expression of affection? Peter says, ah, I love you with phileo love. The second time Jesus says, do you love me with the highest level of affection? Peter says, uh, I love you with phileo love. So the third time Jesus says, Simon, do you really love me with phileo love? Do you really love me with brotherly love? That struck Peter because it is understood in Greek that Jesus is changing the verbiage. Jesus is changing the terminology of love from, from the highest level to now just brotherly love. He says, Peter, do you really love me? And, and it says here, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the, dirt, the third time, do you phileo me? Do you love me with brotherly love? Jesus was not only asking Peter, I'm questioning your agape love, but now he is questioning his brotherly love. This is a cause for great pain in Peter. It says Peter was hurt over this. Peter responds, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. I phileo you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. So what's what's going on here? What's what's happening in this scene? I want you to understand that, that Jesus intentionally, purposefully, was trying to get Peter to understand that he is demanding a agape love to from Peter. He is demanding the highest expression of love, and Peter in his life was saying, I'm not there yet. I haven't shown you that. I haven't proven that to you. I'm, 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 I'm way beneath that. And, and what Peter was trying to do is Peter was trying to not commit to the Lord in agape and stay in the, here it is, you ready for this? Stay in the friend zone. You see, uh, back in college in uh, 19... Uh, 89, yeah, a long time ago, uh, I arrived to this campus in uh, Cleveland, Tennessee, and uh, my heart was set to find my bride, to find my wife. You know, that's that's what just a lot of people do when they go to Bible college. It's like, ah, oh, let me find the right one now. So, uh, so, you know, in my efforts, I failed. I was unsuccessful. I was looking in the wrong places. Uh, so we go home for our Christmas break. We come back in January, and I come back with a fresh energy, fresh effort to find my bride. All along, she was uh, in my class, in one of my classes in the first semester, and so happened to be in my class in the second semester. Uh, I, I knew that, that this was uh, the right person for me, the, the right a woman for me so I pursued it and early on second semester I, I hit a home run I, I I got her to say yes to a first date in February we just got back to school in January 
but I, I was I was energetic and by February we had our first date and you know what we've been together ever since and we were always together so whenever they saw me they saw her whenever they saw her they saw me we were uh, inseparable between classes we were together um, we were just always together but one of the things that early on in our relationship that I told Christy is, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say I love you until I'm ready to marry you. So uh, for a long period of time, for over a year, we would say to each other, I like you. And then that grew to, I like you a lot. To that grew to, I really like you a lot to I really, really like you a lot, to I really, really like you a lot, a lot, a lot. But for over a year, I would not say I love you as I knew that that agape love meant commitment and met forever. But it was April 1991. We just returned from a Japanese steakhouse. I don't know why I remember food, but Japanese steakhouse at a, for a youth leader's appreciation dinner. She returns me back to the church where I was living and uh, she drops me off and right before she, she gets in her car to go back to campus, uh, it was that moment that I expressed to Christy my agape love. I left the friend zone and entered into a committed love. And I knew at that moment when I said I love you in April 1991 that I was ready to marry her. In fact, four months later, August 17th, 1991, we're up in Chattanooga, up on Lookout Mountain, and I bend my knees and I tell her, would you marry me? Why? Because I went from filial love toward agape love, knowing that that was going to be my commitment to her, to love her forever. This is the scenario we in. Peter was in the friend zone with Jesus. Peter did not want to fully commit his life to Christ. He didn't want to agape Peter, uh, agape Jesus quite yet. He wasn't there. And what Jesus was trying to do is restore Peter Restore his life to an agape love. So what do we learn from this? Um, they asked Jesus this supreme question. In fact, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the teachers of the law of that time, got together to ask Jesus this question. They said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? So out of all the commandments, and there are about 613 the commandments throughout scripture and, and, and in their law. So out of all of these, tell us which is the greatest. Je Jesus responds by saying this. Love, using the word agapao, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Jesus is describing to the disciples and to the teachers of the law, this is what agape love looks like this is what the greatest level of expressive affection looks like it is to love your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind this is the first and greatest commandment so back in the beach while Peter and Jesus are having this dialogue Jesus is trying to ask Peter, do you love me with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind? And in Peter's very own honest, sincere confession, he said, no, I'm not there yet. And what Jesus is trying to, to do is to restore him to that place of the highest level of love. And Jesus further goes on to say in verse 39, and the second commandment, the second one is like it, love Agape your neighbor as yourself. 
So there, back in the beach, what he was telling Peter is, do you love me? If you love me, you will love your neighbor. You would go and feed my sheep. You would go and tend my lambs. You would go and feed my lambs. What he was saying is, if you love me, you would go and love others. How to love God. Let, I got two points for you. So, so I, normally it's three. Today's only two. So this is going to go quick. Two things that the Lord wants to tell us on how to love him. How do we express agape love toward God? And number one, love God by doing his will. So Jesus responds by saying, Peter, if you love me, you would do something. If you love me, you would show me. If you love me, you would be obedient. You would feed my sheep. You wouldn't go back to your old life. So loving God is loving God by doing his will and living your new life. Jesus was in essence telling Peter, if you love me, you don't go back to your old life of fishing. If you love me, you would do my will by living your new life. It tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. So the way we express our highest level of affection toward God the way we love God in an agape form is to live our new life. And it's not to go back to our old life. It's not to go back to what's familiar. It's not to go back to what is comfortable. But it's to live our new life. Not to go back to fishing for fish, but fishing for men in Peter's life. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Further, it says in John 14, Jesus replies and tells his disciples, Anyone who loves me, listen, anyone who loves me will what? Obey my teaching. Jesus is saying, if you love me, you will obey. If you love me, you will obey. If you love me, you will obey. He said it three times to Peter. He says it three times to us. Why? Because we are hard-headed. We need to hear it three times. Jesus is telling us, if you love me, you will obey my teaching. You will do my will. He says, my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. How to love God. We love God by doing his will, living your new life. So God is asking of, of us today, and, and you can substitute your name there. Do you love me? Do you agape me? Do you love me with the highest level of affection? You see, in a marriage, a marriage only works if a husband and wife agape each other it is that agape love which is that committed love that lasts forever the problem with many marriages if you don't mind me giving a marriage 101 here the problem with many marriages is that we get involved we get uh, engaged in this love that is limited to filial love that Oh, this person, they're perfect for me. We have so much in common. We're so good friends. And, and in, in reality, what happens after the wedding is you remain in that friend zone. And then reality smacks you in the face and tells you, this person is not my friend anymore. This person is my enemy now. And you lose that filial love because filial love doesn't last forever. You're not always feeling very friendly with one another in a marriage. Some marriages exist just for another third part of love, which is Eros love, which is this infatuation love, love based on attraction. And, and we base our marriage on attraction. And then we get married and we wake up the next morning and we realize that our wife doesn't have any makeup on and we say, I don't Eros you anymore. So we lose our 
phileo love, we lose our eros love. But if we remain with an agape love toward our wives and toward our husbands, those marriages remain. Those marriages last forever because agape love is a committed, unconditional, divine, godly love toward one another. And what God is asking us is, do you have that type of love toward me? Is it a committed love? If you just base your love on God, on the phileo, if you just love God as, a, as in brotherly love, in friendship love, you're going to be tempted to go back to your old life. Because that feeling won't always last. It won't always exist. Number two. How to love God? Love God by loving others. Love by serving. It tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Let us love one another. For the genesis, the birthplace of love, is God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So the very proof, the very criteria for being a child of God, being born of God, is that you love and that you love one another. Verse 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. That is his very character. God loves you because that is who he is. He loves you in an agape form because he cannot change that about himself because that's the essence of his very character. God is agape. God is love, he tells us. Then it says in verse 20, chapter 4, St. First John, it says, Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. It's it says it clearly, liar, liar, pants on fire. You do not love God if you do not love your brother or sister. So loving God is proven by your love toward everyone else. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Verse 21 and he has given us this command, very clear. They ask Jesus, what's the greatest command? And he says, love God and love others. First John tells us here, he has given us this command. Anyone that who loves God must also love their brothers and sisters. So loving God in an agape form, in a committed form, is proven by our love toward one another. You know, during this quarantine time, to, during this crisis time, uh, early on, I remember watching the news where they were first requesting that we stay quarantined. Yet for some reason, Florida's beaches were open to spring breakers. And there were just hundreds, maybe thousands of these college kids coming to St. Petersburg, Pinellas, Miami, South Beach, Jacksonville Beach, and, and they were just partying because that's what they do. And in this, in one of these news interviews, they were asking a college kid, they were saying, why aren't you abiding by the quarantine regulations? His response was, I'm young and and it, I'm not going to get it. And if I get it, I'll defeat it. I, I, I'll get over it. I'll overcome it. So I'm going to be just fine. See, the problem with that mentality was he very well may get it and very well overcome it and be fine. But he's only doing that by loving himself. If he does not protect himself, he would not have the ability to protect others who would be vulnerable to the virus. So love is not about you. 
It is not. Love is not about me. It is not. Love has no partnership with selfishness. Love is selfless. Love says it's not about me, but it's about you. And that's the whole purpose. You know, I go to Publix, I go to Sam's Club, and I wear a mask. Not in fear that, that I'm going to get the virus. Maybe, maybe not. But that's not my concern. My concern is if I have it some way, somehow, and I'm asymptomatic, uh, I don't want to put it on, on anyone else. I don't want to share this. And that's what love does. The, love says it's not about me and my comfort. It's not about me and, my, and what's familiar to me. It's not about me and what I want to do. It's about what I can do to love others. A marriage works because a spouse says it's not about my needs, but it's about the needs of my spouse. The other spouse says it's not about my needs, but it's about the needs of my spouse. And if both of them echo that same commitment toward one another, that becomes agape love because they love one another above themselves. Jesus says, if, if, if you're going to love me, you're, you're going to obey my teachings. You're going to obey my commands. And here is my command to love one another. How do, we love, how do we learn to love God? We do it by uh, loving what's familiar, what's comfortable. If you've gone back to fishing, God is calling you again out of fishing and saying, I've called you to be a new creation. I've called you to be a new person. Number two, uh, we love God by loving others. That is our expression of, the way we prove that we love God is, is by loving other people. So let's insert our names into this slide. Joel, do you dearly and deeply love me? So that's the question that is on the table that Jesus is asking you. There in, in my hearing and in, in my seeing, you, you can hear me and see me. This is what Jesus is asking of you today. Do you, listen, do you dearly and deeply love me? Not do you love me like a buddy, like a pal, like a friend. But do you have an agape love toward me? Do you have a committed love toward me? He gives us the response by saying, then live your new life and do the work that I have asked you by loving others. So the question for us today to contemplate, the question is, do I, do I agape Jesus? Do I really, really love him? Do I love him deeply and dearly? If I do, then that will be expressed in my new life and how I love other people. So today I'm, I'm aware that this message is reaching people that are in different places, different distances to God. Some of you are back in the courtyard where you are denying Christ. I want to speak this message of restoration toward you and say that if you're in that place of being in denial of Christ, being ashamed of Jesus, I want to tell you with compassion today that Jesus wants to restore you. Do you remember that previously Jesus told Peter, you will deny me because Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. Jesus is praying for your restoration. Jesus wants you back. And I know that I'm speaking to others today who are in the, in out fishing. And they're back to their old life. They're doing things that they did when they were not trusting God with their life. And today Jesus is calling out from the beach and he's calling out 
for you. And he's saying, come to me. I know that you may be discouraged out there. I know that you may be in sorrow, that you may be in pain out there. But if you come to me, I will provide for you. Don't you see I have already made the bread and the fish? I'm already proven that if you would just come to me, I will provide for you. And more than that, I, I want to have a dialogue with you. I want you to get from a place of discouragement to a place of love. Thirdly, I may be speaking to people who are sitting at the beach with Jesus. Just finished breakfast and Jesus is asking you, do you really agape me? If you do, then you will do my will. Let me close with the end of this chapter. So after Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter responded, yes, yes, and yes. Peter and Jesus began to walk away. And they had an opportunity to have a one-on-one. -on -one. Because Jesus told Peter this prophecy, this prediction. Jesus told Peter, one day you will become old and someone else will stretch your hand. and You will go where you don't want to be. The following verse says Jesus was predicting the kind of death that Peter would have. So Jesus was telling Peter, Peter, one day you will be crucified. And someone is going to stretch your hand forward and nail it to a board. And this was Peter's response. Peter understood what Jesus was saying. In fact, tradition tells us that Peter was crucified. In fact, he was crucified backwards, upside down. Because when he was crucified, he, he told them, I, I don't feel worthy enough to be crucified like my Lord. So he was crucified upside down. But when Jesus and, and Peter were walking away, this is what G Peter responds. Peter says, how about John? John was there. He says, how about that guy? Jesus says, what about that guy? What if I desire for him to stay alive until my second coming, until I return again? What, what if that's my plan for him? It's none of your business, Peter. We're talking about you and your responsibility, you and your task. And Peter was busy worrying about somebody else's calling. And that's where some of us are today as well. God has asked something of you. And you're busy worrying about somebody else's calling. Jesus says, that's none of your business. I'm calling you to do something for me. Doesn't matter what I've called somebody else to do. Their calling is different. So you see, Jesus teaches Peter a lesson that will last forever. Because after that, Peter committed his life to an agape love. And it was Peter who preached the first message where thousands were saved. It was Peter who helped establish the early church. It was Peter that at the end of his life was crucified upside down for his Savior. Peter, the once betrayer who denied him. Peter, the one who went back fishing when he wasn't supposed to. Peter ended up being committed to Jesus. That means there's hope for you and I. That's what that means. 
So in whatever category, whatever place you are in life, there is hope for us. There is restoration for us. There is compassion for us. Jesus is calling for us. Can we use this moment just for prayer? Would you, there where you are, would you close your eyes so that you're not distracted by someone who's sitting next to you in pajamas or just, just you and the Lord for the next few moments? Because I believe God is speaking to us. He is asking us, do you really, really love me? Do you deeply and dearly love me? Do you love me with a committed love? Let us pray. Father, as we gather in your presence right now, I am convinced and I know that you are with me here and you are with the audience where they are. And you are asking us the same question. Do you deeply and dearly love me? And our response is measured by where we are in life. Some of us are saying, I have not proven that to you. I have not been faithful in what you're asking me to do. Therefore, I, I have not agape you, God. I'm not there. Some of us are, are saying, yeah, you know that I phileo you. I, I, I've done the best I could. And, and Jesus is saying, no, no. Do you love me with a committed love? Are you willing to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me? Do you love me to that level? So God, I pray today that you would convict our hearts, and that you would interpret this message into our minds so that we may have understanding of your word, that you would bring clarity to what the enemy is trying to confuse us of even now, and that we may respond properly to what you are asking of us. You are asking of, of us to to love you with a committed love, with an agape love. And the way we do this is by doing your will, by living the new life, being the new creation that you are building in us. And by loving those around us. For that is the greatest commandment. And if we are able to do these things, then we are able to express our committed love to you. So God, would you help us because we are weak people and we need your help. We need you to intervene for us. Thank you for restoring us to that place of love. Thank you for forgiving us and having mercy on us when we were in denial of you and when we went back to our old life, thank you for your mercy. For it's your mercy that has caused me to return to you. And now that we are here, God, would you accept us? Would you embrace us? Father, we are committed to you, to loving you with the highest level of affection. God, we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, believing it to be true by saying amen and amen. Thank you, church. Thank you if you prayed that prayer today. Thank you if you have gone from the beach to walking with Jesus one-on-one -on -one in intimacy. Thank you if you have gone from the sea to the shore today thank you if you have gone from the courtyard to become reconciled with god once again thank you for that prayer i ask you today that these thoughts would continue in you 
that you don't allow these seeds to be somehow stolen away or plucked away from your life, but that you would let this word be planted deeply in your hearts. Again, thank you for tuning in to truth. And I pray that this message uh, made a difference in your life. Until next week, chances are we'll be in a virtual setting, but I'm here live just like you are there live. And I pray that uh, we would gather in God's name again. Thank you. God bless you and your family. Stay safe and don't eat too much. Amen. Amen.